Nobody in here. Though. Okay, I will call this meeting to order of the Topeka Development Corporation. Um, we will stand as you are able for the Pledge of Allegiance before we move to roll call. Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Brenda, if you will call the roll, please. All right. So, uh, Board President Padilla. Here. Vice President Dobler. Here. Directors Hiller. Here. Ortiz. Here. Valdivia Aqua. Here. Banks. Kell. Here. Miller. He's here. Duncan. Here. And Hofer. Here. All right, we have nine yes, uh, and we have, I'm sorry, nine present, <laughs> and Councilmember Banks. I'm here. I'm here. Gotcha. I've got you noted. Thank you. <laughs> okay, move on to uh, the agenda item number four. Uh, Brenda, if you'll read. Oh, A is approval of the November 14, 2023 minutes, meeting minutes. Can we do this by consent? Okay. So... Everybody should have a copy of those uh, minutes. Uh, the chair will entertain a motion. Move to approve. Second. Okay, motion to approve by Councilman Duncan, second by Councilman Dobler. I will take the roll call. Um, and we can do it by consensus. Can if we you'd do like. it by? Okay. You can do it by voice vote. Yep. All, all those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. okay. Thank you. We'll move on now to. Um, uh, Mr. City Manager, do you want to uh, introduce the next item uh, that we have on the agenda today? Oh, no. It's approval of the 2024 operating budget for Hotel Topeka. Okay, Mr. City Manager. All right, as you know, Mayor and Governing Body and the public, um, this, this development corporation um, runs the hotel, okay? So uh, what what Braxton's going to present to you is an operating budget for this year, which is our best guess, just like with a municipal budget, about what the expenses and the revenue are going to be. So, Braxton? Thank you, uh, Board. Um, in December, uh, GF Hotels presented us with the draft operating budget. I have to thank Rick Pastorino, who I'll introduce to sitting to my left, is the principal of Redpar. He and his assistant, Paul Landry, took a deep dive into the budget and basically helped guide me and walk me through in terms of what to look at uh, because they are experts in this industry. We have a distressed asset. I'm not going to try to deceive you, right? We have a distressed asset that has um, occupancy of 33 34% on an annual average basis, has rev par of about $35. Um, given that, the operating budget that we have put forth to in, for your approval is a net operating loss. Now, we have revenue of approximately $4.3 million, and we have challenged the staff, and this is actually a 3% increase over the operating budget revenue from last year. So we have challenged them setting an aspirational but achievable goal to try to do the best that they can with this distressed asset. Offsetting $4.3 million in gross revenue, we have $4.2 million of expenses, leaving a gross operating profit of approximately $140,000. From that, you have to deduct the management fees and then other expenses, including insurance and taxes, which are approximately $400,000, which comes to a net operating loss projected of $396,000 for the year. That's the reality of this particular asset that we are going to have to supplement this to be able to, to get it in until we can attract an owner operator to come in and take this asset on and to do a significant investment to be able to make it marketable. With that, I would gladly stand for any questions and would ask for you to approve this proposed operating budget. Okay, any questions uh, for uh, Braxton from the body? Checking online, the council members. Councilman Duncan. 
I'm sure it does because I think I saw the line. But this also includes our payment in lieu of taxes that we're, we've contracted with ourselves to pay back, correct? I want, I want to be really careful how we phrase that language uh, because a, a pilot is not permissible. Uh, but this budget does include a um, operational service charge um, in an amount equal to what the real property taxes would be for that particular hotel. Okay, I just think that's important to point out since we were very clear we wanted that to continue to be it, and that's probably half of this loss, which mm -hmm. doesn't mean it's not a loss, but it's an important thing to note as to partly why that number is where it is. Thank you. Councilman, further questions? Councilman, Councilwoman Ortiz. Braxton, um, and correct me if I, if I misheard you, but you said you've asked them to looking to do with you ask them to work with what they have is that correct um the the, the staff that's already there is yes ma'am so it, so what where i'm going with this is did you also ask them to look and see where they could cut in 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 any areas um i don't know if it's appropriate but i got an email from somebody there that said that they could use somebody cheaper, but we're told that they were not able to do that. So I will tell you that Rick and I met with the hotel manager and the um, uh, person in charge of their booking marketing today, and basically they are operating on a skeleton staff. So we have asked them to cut where they can cut, but still be able to keep the hotel open. And so they're working with the minimal staff. Um, and that goes across the board. I mean, for, mm -hmm. for breakfast, you have one person working with the, with the cook who's basically serving the breakfast. You have minimal maid staff so that if they have a large number of rooms, it may be days before they can actually get to those. So certainly we've asked them to cut where it is possible, but you can only cut, cut so low. We've also challenged them to do everything that they can to market that hotel to try to bring biz business in. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Councilman, uh, on that marketing aspect, are we working with the Oakview Group that, since they're the managers of the event center, on any things that are going on there uh, with their events, trying to help drive in business? Um, because I, I felt like it was a little too late for us to plan anything, but like New Year's Eve, they they had the rodeo there and turned around and people wanted to do stuff. But to me, it would have been great if we could have rolled them over from the event center over to the hotel. Uh, in some of those uh, spaces we had there. Yeah, so we have, we have asked for them to coordinate the efforts with the Expo Center in terms of where there are opportunities that we can help. We do have a new marketing manager who's come on board. Uh, we were able to hire her away from, a, from another hotel. She had experience at Hotel Topeka, and she is now meeting monthly with the Expo staff with Visit Topeka to be able to t try to develop a plan in terms of how can we work together. Councilman Healer. Thank you, Mayor. I just wanted to comment that, um, you know, because the public is concerned and, and all sorts of comments happen, have happened along the way to this point about the hotel, I've had reason to be in there a couple times lately, and it really looks pretty good. And just wanted to thank you and, and through you, the staff and everybody who's working so hard to hold it together. And um, I'm hopeful that with that, that we, we make sure we put that out when we make public comments so that people who are considering whether to have an event or a hotel there will go ahead and book it. Um, so appreciate it. Thank you. So Rick actually commented to me as we were walking through the lobby after meeting with management staff today that this place really looks good. And, yeah. and part of that is we took on the additional small capital investment to get the pumps working. So we now have fountains working in that, in that atrium area as opposed to just having empty basins, right? Mm -hmm. So it, it adds to the ambiance. We're addressing life safety issues as they come up. So we, you know, obviously we heard you loud and clear. Do you want us to keep this hotel open? Mm -hmm. We're doing that. We're doing the best that we can with a, with a small crew. Thank you. Councilman Dover. Thank you, Mayor uh, Braxton. We appreciate what you're doing, what the uh, staff is doing out there. It is getting better, and that's all we can ask for at this point. And with that, I'll move approval. Okay. Motion to approve by Councilman Dobler, second by Councilman Kale. Uh, consensus as well? Um, 
probably a roll call to begin on okay. this one. Roll call then. Okay. Uh, Director Hiller? Yes. Valdivia Acala? No. Ortiz? Uh, Banks is gone. Uh, Kel? Yes. Miller? Yes. Dobler? Yes. Duncan? Yes. Hofer? Yes. And Padilla? Yes. All right, we have seven yes with Valdivia, Acla, and Ortiz voting no. The motion carries. Okay, thank you. Okay, we'll move on to the next uh, item on the agenda. Uh, Brenda, if you'll read, please. Six is updated the Revpar International Summary Analysis of Hotel Topeka. Thank you. Senior Manager? I will turn this over to Braxton again so he can uh, walk through this report with us. And again, I'll introduce Rick Pastorino, Principal for Revpar International. Rick is a expert in this field. Rick works for you. His, his duty of loyalty is to you. It, it's not to some other third party entity. It's he is doing this analysis, making recommendations to help walk you guys through what we do, what the fu future that is and what the options are based on his 30 plus years of experience in this industry. And with that, I will turn it over to Rick to go over and summarize the analysis that they've been done, his recommendations, and the next steps. Thank you, Rick. Thank you, everybody. Appreciate being here. Um, just to sort of set the stage and put everything into context, Repar International was tasked with reviewing the subject hotel's historical performance as well as that of its competitive market and recommending a strategy that will return the hotel to its former competitive position in the marketplace, given its importance as a selling tool for the adjacent Stormont Event Center and Maynard Conference Center. Once the recommended strategy was determined, we were then tasked with preparing financial projections for the hotel under a series of scenarios in order to establish what the value of the asset was so that the city, you, have an understanding of the value of its current investment in the property relative to the purchase price for use in attracting a buyer to carry out the renovation and the repositioning. Just as important, our financial and valuation would establish whether the cost of the renovation is supported by the future cash flows of the hotel that it could generate, uh, or in the, inter in the alternative, whether the city would need to provide incentives to an eventual buyer in order for that buyer to commit to the renovation plan that the city is looking for there. Ultimately, the city is intent, our understanding, on ensuring that the hotel complements versus detracts from the ability of both the Stormont Event Center and the Manor Conference Center to attract groups and other travelers to their event halls and facilities there as well as the hotel. So that's sort of the, the framework under which we came in to do our work. I have a series of slides here that I'm gonna go through, hopefully quickly, um, not to bore everybody, just to um, let you know what our findings were and then open for questions. So we're going to take you through what's Rick, been done. Yes. You're not going to bore us. I want you to give us the details. I want to hear it. I think everybody else will. Okay? Understood. Take the time. Um, what we've done to date, what our recommendations and proposed strategy is to you, and then what the next step should be. So, and I'm going to have to pivot between, well, I guess I can just lean over here. Can everybody hear me if I yeah. lean over a little bit? So this is our methodology process that we go through. We conduct a site visit. Myself and Paul Landry were here for three days uh, speaking to a number of people in the market, mostly hotels, uh, economic development, the Stormont uh, Event Center, as well as uh, city, uh, I'm sorry, Visit Topeka. Just understanding the hotel market here, what's driving it, where are people coming from, why do they come here, how do you get more business, and so on. So we went through that, and then we go back to our office, and I call it we separate the wheat from the chaff. We do a lot of follow-up work and research to understand whether or not what we heard is valid um, and, and can be used on a go-forward basis, because ultimately we're going to be projecting out into the future. So we go through that process. We put together the historical market, and I'll show you some numbers here, um, and then we project out into the future what the hotel market is going to uh, perform 
like under certain scenarios. We try and identify any new hotel supply that's going to come online. Luckily, right now, given what's going on in the capital markets and what's going on in this particular hotel market, there is no future supply, so that's helpful. Um, uh, and then we identify where the demand growth is going to come from for the hotels that exist here in the marketplace. Then we go back to the existing hotel. We evaluate its positioning in the market, its size, uh, what facilities it has, who it's competing against, and then we recommend a strategy as to how to improve it. Obviously, the facility's tired. It's been neglected for a number of years at this point. And then uh, we uh, establish whether or not one of the critical issues that we needed to evaluate was whether or not it should be branded uh, with one of the national <coughs> chains, such as Hilton or Marriott or anything, or remain independent as it exists today and has been since it opened. Um, once we established that, and we actually ran two scenarios, one is an independent and one assuming it was branded, we prepare financial projections under those uh, parameters, and then we estimate what the value would be on a, going, on a, on a future basis. We start with the SWOT analysis, what the strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats are for the asset in particular. I won't go through all of these, but I will highlight that the strengths obviously are its location next to the uh, Stormont Vale Event Center and the Manor Center. This, uh, those two facilities are a significant economic impact for the city uh, overall. And I will tell you that in terms of talking to the hotels around here, we were told consistently that when the hotel can pull in large groups into that facility there in conjunction with the event center next door, it helps all the hotels in the city. So if they're bringing in, they can only handle 224 rooms, and if they're bringing in a group that's anything over 200 rooms, it spills over into the other hotels in the city, and we heard that consistently from the other hotels. So to that point, the other hotels are just as anxious to see improvements made there because at this point, we also heard that a number of groups are now avoiding the event center because of the condition of the hotel. So there's probably, in our estimation, about 10 to 20,000 room nights conservatively of group business that are avoiding Topeka because of the condition of the facility. They'd love to come and use the event center, but uh, when they walk them next door, the meeting planners next door to look at the hotel. Uh, they're they're dissuaded from coming here because they know their customers are not going to um, not going to like staying there. Uh, so those are some of the weaknesses: the poor condition, uh, the location in the state capital, the per diem rate here is relatively low, which makes it difficult for uh, pulling in groups that want to pay a higher rate. So that's sort of a, a guardrail there that we need to take into consideration when we're projecting out into the future. This is a low, what we call a low rev par market. The occupancy for the collective hotels in the city is roughly 64% as of year end 23. Um, and the average rate for the market is just over $100 collectively for all the hotels, including the, the subject hotel. So when you combine those two together, that tells you what the rev par is for all the hotel rooms that exist in the city. And comparatively speaking, when we put it up against national averages and so on, it's, it's low, which makes it difficult for operators to generate net income on the bottom line to pay for their debt service and everything else. So that's a, that's a concern that we need to be aware of as we go forward. The opportunities is bringing back a lot of that group business that we talked about that is avoiding the market right now. There's actually other group business that hasn't even considered coming here because there's not an appropriate facility for them to stay in. So if you do renovate the hotel, uh, there are other groups out there that you could market to and hopefully pull into the city as the state capital here uh, that would enjoy using that hotel. Um, branding the hotel is an opportunity for that facility. We, and you'll see this later, we weighed the alternatives of remaining independent versus uh, branding the hotel. Given the history of the hotel, the fact that it became distressed, ended up being taken back by the bank, and is now viewed unfavorably by many people, both locally and other group meeting planners out there, we think that the, the 
path to get it back to its former um, status is through branding it because that will add a significant level of credibility to it if it's branded as a Hilton or a Marriott as opposed to trying to recoup business as a Hotel Topeka or another name. Um, so that's that's a consideration, a serious consideration that we that we think uh, is is worth doing, although there is a cost to that. But ultimately, it ends up being a stronger financial statement than remaining independent. And then the threats, obviously, are the inability to sell the Hotel Topeka to a private sector owner without proper incentives, because it will need incentives, as you'll see later on. Um, the the Loss of the renovation continues, I'm sorry, the cost of the renovation continues to rise as time goes on. As we all know, nothing ever gets cheaper. It always increases, so the longer we wait, uh, the more expensive it will be. And there's always the possibility of new supply. Not on the horizon right now, so it's an opportune time to try and bring in a private sector uh, hotel owner operator uh, to take on this project without the threat of additional supply coming online. Here's just a map of how the uh, competitive hotels lay out in the city. You can see in the, the red dot in the middle is the Hotel Topeka. The number 10 is the Hotel Cyrus. Interesting to the point of branding versus not branding. I think you probably all know uh, living here that when the Hotel Cyrus first opened up, it opened up as an independent hotel. And then after two years, ownership decided to affiliate the hotel because it wasn't uh, performing as well as they had expected. And once they put the Marriott name on that hotel, uh, performance improved dramatically at that hotel. And I'm sure if you talk to the owner, he'll, he'll, he'll indicate that. That's what they indicated to us when we spoke to them. The balance of the supply is out on the interstate along where your retail corridors and what we call your demand generators are. That's where the, the bulk of your, your other hotel supply is. Um, so you can see that from... Uh, locational perspective, the Hotel Topeka is somewhat isolated, but it has probably one of the largest demand generators sitting next to it in the event center. So that's a key, obvious re reason why it's there. Um, this graph right here, what I wanted to show really, and it's a little busy, but this shows the performance in blue of the Hotel Topeka in the three critical metrics that we focus on from an, uh, a, a room's revenue perspective. It's the occupancy of the hotel on an annual basis. It's the average daily rate, ADR, uh, which is the average room rate that you get over the course of the year for uh, the rooms in the hotel. And then when you combine those two together, you get the rev par of the hotel, which tells you how much revenue per available room is being generated. I don't want to own, overwhelm you with acronyms. We did put a glossary in the back of the presentation um, if, if I'm, I'm calling out an acronym that you may not understand. I apologize for that. Um, but what I wanted to point out is if you look at 2019, you can see that although the Hotel Topeka was performing below the balance of the hotels that are in the orange color in the market, in 2023, you can see how much less it's performing against that same set of hotels. So the performance of the hotel has obviously deteriorated over time as we went through COVID and came out of it. And now it's running, as Braxton mentioned, a $33 rev par compared to the, the whole market that's running a $69 rev par. So it's less than 50% of the rev par of the entire market. Whereas before, if you go back to 19, it was 60 to 65% of the rev par of the, of the whole market. So, um, and the issue, it, again, relates to both the distressed nature of the asset and its tired condition. Here, this table just basically summarizes the financial performance of the hotel. So you'll see that back in 2019, it was able to generate a bottom line uh, income of roughly $800,000 on about $7 million in total revenue. Uh, it went through COVID, lost a significant amount of money. And as Braxton pointed out, the GF management budget for 24 is indicating that they'll do about $4.3 million in revenue with roughly a $400,000 loss. Um, when we went to evaluate brands and whether or not to brand it or maintain its independence, we looked at a series of brands. Uh, the preferred brand is Doubletree for a couple of reasons, and we'll, we'll, we'll show you on the next slide. 
but there are alternative brands out there. Uh, this is really ultimately going to be the decision of whoever comes in and wants to purchase the hotel and, and work with you to put that back in, in, in the best condition. Um, we talked to Marriott. They'd be willing to franchise it as a Delta hotel. Uh, they would also be willing to franchise it as a Sheridan hotel. IHG, Intercontinental Hotels, offered Crown Plaza as well as Holiday Inn. Now, there's we call it a product improvement plan that's required by all of these uh, branding companies. If they put their name on it, they want it to be uh, restored to a certain level. And the cost of doing that is different with all these brands. We chose Doubletree because the cost of the product improvement plan that was put forth that GF costed out for us was roughly $12 million. When we talked to Marriott, the indication was they told us what they wanted to do. And when we ran some rough estimates and there were some other uh, participants in the market that also looked at this previous to us, uh, the estimate for converting it to a Marriott branded hotel was substantially higher than the 12 million. So we felt that you could get just as much of a solid bang for your dollar as a Hilton Doubletree as you could as a Marriott. Crown Plaza and Holiday Inn, although they're excellent brands, they don't have the, the, um, the, the strength with the meeting planners as much as Hilton and Marriott do. Um, so that's why we deferred to Doubletree. But again, this is what we felt was the best strategy on a go-forward basis. Ultimately, it will be the decision of, of the private equity coming in on how they want to brand the hotel. So branding versus independent, these are the factors. I've mentioned a number of these already. The product improvement plan for Doubletree was $12 million. If you were to uh, do this as an independent hotel, you obviously have a lot more leeway. Uh, so the estimated cost was $10 million uh, under that scenario. Uh, Hilton provides you access to 160 million loyalty members. We call it the, the pipe. I mean, when you, when you affiliate with a brand, Marriott has 180 million loyalty members. Hilton has 160. IHG has 100 plus million. They all have 100 millions of, of members, and that's what you're trying to gain access to because a lot of those people just go to those websites when they go to make their reservations. They don't really go to uh, Expedia or some of these others because they're brand loyal to these, to these chains. So accessing 160 million loyalty members would be significant upside to the hotel. Um, the strength of the brand, uh, we've done thousands of studies across the country, and when you look at the performance of uh, branded hotels against independent, uh, they outperform them uh, in terms of RevPAR, overall rate and occupancy by a significant margin. Uh, again, the hotel lends itself to needing some national credibility amongst the market that it's going after after having gone through the last few years as a distressed property and an entire shape. Um, there are a couple of things we want to uh, call out here is that the $12 million excludes the cost to renovate the Manor Conference Center. That's a county property. And I will point out, and I think uh, Braxton has probably pointed this out to you, any effort to renovate the Hotel Topeka without renovating the Manor Conference Center is, is going to create a dual product that will ultimately limit the ability of the Hotel Topeka to achieve the stabilized results that we're projecting. The assumption is, is that the Manor alongside the hotel will be renovated at the same time so that the product is consistent at the end and they're both fresh uh, upon completion. Uh, the second thing is the product improvement costs are in addition to the acquisition costs. You paid $7.5 million for the hotel. And the building improvement outlined in the, in the, in the PCR or the PCA, the property condition assessment, um, that I think uh, some of the items that Braxton is addressing right now are included in that PCA. With that said, we went ahead and we prepared projections as a double tree by Hilton that shows... Uh, for timeline purposes, 24 is as is the, in its current state. 25, we assumed for the purpose of this analysis that 
the city would be able to find a buyer and consummate a deal uh, some point between July and December of 24 so that the new owner would take over in 25. The renovation would then occur in 25 so that as of January 26, uh, the property would be fresh and affiliated with Hilton Doubletree. Those are the assumptions that we used in terms of projecting out our performance here. So you can see that the performance of the hotel starts to dramatically improve in 26 after it's been renovated and, um, and again, going out and securing business that either was coming here and uh, stopped coming here because of the condition or generating new business for the hotel that hasn't been here before. Uh, ultimately, we get to a 14.2% uh, NOI. EBITDA is a, an acronym that's in the glossary if you want to look it up, but uh, and it's the equivalent of net operating income, and we get to 14.2% uh, by 2031. <coughs> As an independent, uh, and I'll just flip back between these two, on the NOI, you can see that we end at $2.3 million. As an independent, we end at $1.8 million. So the, the takeaway really is that the difference between independent and branded is roughly $500,000 in net income to the bottom line. And if you capitalize that, convert that into it's how it helps the value of the asset, that's roughly coming out to uh, incremental value of $8 million overall. So if the asset is worth $20 million, uh, as an independent, it's worth $28 million as a branded hotel. That's basically what this is telling you. When we go through and run this through our investment model, our return on investment model, when this first column to the left assumes the city owns it, we're looking at it from the vantage point of January 1st of 2024, so when we do our discounted cash flow and our internal rate of return, um, we and don't assume any incentives provided by the city, it generates roughly a 10% internal rate of return, which is what most private equity investors will use as their main hurdle rate to decide whether or not they're going to invest in a property. And from our experience working with many, many private equity investors, 10% is not going to entice them to come into T Topeka and purchase an asset and take on that level of risk. Um, so we went back and we redid the analysis, assuming one incentive. There are others out there that you could add to this, but we understand that the property would be available for a 10-year abatement of their real estate taxes. Uh, we were working with uh, a, a local company here that established what that abatement would be on an annual basis. So we factored that into our return on investment analysis, and that increased the internal rate of return to 21%, which is getting closer to where we think private equity would be interested in coming in and taking on this project. We think baseline, you probably need to be closer to 25%, if not north of that. But, we, but just that tax abatement alone for 10 years, uh, is getting us close to that number. And this, this is assuming, again, up top here, we included all of the costs that the city has into it currently, the carry cost that you'll have for 24 until you exit it, and then the cost of the PIP. And there's also a contingency in there. So that all adds up to $26 million. So there's a lot of variations that we could work with here, but we wanted to stick with a basic scenario to present to you uh, so you had an understanding of, of where this sat and what it was going to take to entice private equity to come in because private equity is going to have their own reaction to this and they may be looking for something different. Um, so that's where we are to date. Uh, we've accomplished the market study. We've done the branding analysis. We've prepared financial and uh, return on investment analysis. And we assisted, as Braxton mentioned, in terms of the hotel budget review. So the next steps are outlined here, uh, depending on where you want to go. Um, anything to add, Braxton? 
No. Um, fair analysis again. Rick just lightly touched upon the, the on the last slide that he did, and just to underscore that, we could spend a whole lot of time and conjecture in terms of what what potential incentive package until we get out there and actually develop an RFP or directly, Rick's got contacts in the industry, directly uh, reaching out to potential owner operators and then ultimately negotiating what that financial incentive package looks like to be able to attract a good hotel owner operator into this market. And obviously the terms of that are going to be determined by the governing body. So, it, it, you know, I just want to make it clear that we're going to have to put together some level of incentive package to be able to market this hotel, to be able to market it to a good owner operator. Okay. And so from my perspective, um, I want to get your feedback in terms of, are we, are we following your direction? Are we going where you want us to go? Because to me, the next steps would be have Rick and Paul reach out to potential owner operators that they know. Uh, to see if we can entice someone that would say, yeah, we're willing to do it, and here's the terms that it would take. If not, if we can't do it through that informal way, then I think that we, we either engage a broker or we develop a RFP um, and basically put it out there that we're interested in selling and then uh, negotiating the terms of that with the assistance of, of Rick and Paul. Uh, because I, what I heard clearly from you over the last couple of months is that you do not want to be in the business of owning and operating this hotel and taking on the renovation. You want us to find an owner operator to take, to take that next step. Councilman McCown. I, I think branding is a really good idea. Uh, as it was pointed out, brand loyalty, a lot of people, um, do that, but, uh, I think we definitely need to do something with our website. It just, to me, it was it was very, I was just messing around with it while I was listening to you all. To just try to figure out how to make a reservation was very difficult for me to try to figure out that. Uh, so that right there, if I get frustrated and I'm trying to travel, if it's making it difficult, um, I, I'd kind of make it sweet and simple. We have very good reviews actually online for, for our hotel from the different uh, major travel sites. I, I really pushed that. And I'd actually try to, I don't know if you can run the numbers on it with your model, uh, long-term stays. You know, we have, we have a lot of the uh, state legislator stays during the week while they're in session and seeing what we could do to maybe entice them to stay there uh, while they're in session. You know, it's, as, as you pointed out, close to the Capitol. Right. Council member, hotel staff are trying to entice some long-term stay by um, legislators, lobbyists. To help try to generate some revenue at yeah. this at this property. Sure. Thank you. So th those are the kind of my, my, my thoughts and comments on the, on everything that's been put out so far. Councilman Duncan and then Councilman Dover. So Rick, walk us through a general timeline. If we said to you, yes, we'd start with you. See if you know people willing to sit down with our staff and talk about what incentives and packages would look like. What your time frame for doing that would be before you could come back and say, ah, close, couldn't find anyone, before we went the RFP route and brought in someone else to then market it. I mean, in, in theory, from my perspective, you're here. <laughs> you, know, if you try the first thing and hope it works, and if it doesn't, you can try the next one always. And, and since you've already, you know the facility now and you're willing to work. So I'm just curious what that looks, what that process looks like in a time frame for you. Sure, typically, so once we get familiar with an asset, Given the work we do across the country, we can we we can identify a handful, and I wouldn't go more than a, a handful at this point, of appropriate owner operators that should have an interest in this, uh, and we would go talk to them, explain to them the asset, uh, see whether or not there is a level of interest, provide them whatever information they need to come back to. Uh, Council the city with an offer, um, and then from that point, it's it's a negotiation of that. In order to get from today to that point, uh, we probably need I'm going to say 45 to 60 days. Okay, no, that's very helpful. And I, I mean, I think I'm not going to details tonight, but I, I think you'll find the majority of us are willing to 
put together some packages that look pretty good. We hope to your investors and, and you know what those need to look like too to attract those folks. So I'm glad you're here and that's why we brought you in. Thank you. Councilman Dover. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I'm encouraged. I think of, of all the things we did here, um, uh, hiring you to take a look at this, you and your firm, makes a lot of sense. This has a lot of credibility and and I I really think we move, I mean, yeah, we're gonna have to put together some incentives. We do that for all kinds of, of uh, developments in this city. There's no reason we can't do it for something as important as this. Um, I would uh, I would suggest we move ahead with the, I'm gonna call it uh, option A. To the two-step process of first trying to have Rick reach out directly to owner operators that He's aware of, and if that if that doesn't come to fruition, then we'll go with either broker or RFP route. We're not going to call it the Kansas two-step, though, right? <laughs> okay. um, yeah, I, th I think I'm definitely in favor of that. It looks like it's going to yield. And, and we always have the option of reverting back to a general RFP. And, you know, I, I will just add this. There's an education that we'll all get in terms of just doing that first step because understanding what market is looking for is going to come from this process. So if there's a significant delta between what private equity's expectations are and what the city's expectations are, that's going to, that's going to come to fruition very quickly within the next 60 days. One additional question, if I could, Mayor. Yes. Mm -hmm. If we wanted to build this hotel... A similar sized hotel right now, just roughly what would we be talking? Significantly more than twenty six million dollars. <laughs> yeah. Significantly more, more probably. Okay. Thank you. Right. Councilwoman Hiller. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I appreciate this whole report. Something that strikes me though, and we knew it was an issue when we got into it, and you've touched on it today, and I'm not sure I see it reflected here is that issue that, I mean, we're, we're shoring up the base, so we're taking care of it, we're doing due diligence, we're, we're, we're demonstrating that we can keep it open and so on, but if the Maynard Conference Center is critical to somebody being interested in it and, and it is critical to, for people even today to have confidence that they should book their wedding reception there or their convention that needs that space, could you bring us current on what conversations you've had with the county and what the where we are with the, having that committed along with the package. We continue to have ongoing conversations uh, with the county through their county counselor's office. I believe there's an understanding that something needs to be done with Manor, but there's been no funds or timeline identified for that. Um, thank you. I guess I feel like we should we should be working either ourselves, city to county elected officials, or through staff to to firm that up so that you've got a clear um, either single proposed move, next moves or at least some options. Um, so for what that's worth, however we do that. Uh, if I may ask a question, if we move forward, Mike, uh, Councilman Dover suggests that we would do that and you would reach out to those but you have described as a handful of qualified equity owners. That, and if we, as a body, are aware of others that maybe are not on your radar, if we provide those contacts to you, would you include them uh, in consideration so that we, uh, if we have some developing uh, interest that maybe you're still not aware of, that it gets included in that? effort so that we can move forward on this? Absolutely. Okay. Yeah, please uh, provide those to me and then I'll pass those along to uh, Rick and his team. Okay. Councilman Duncan. Just one quick comment. I want to piggyback off of Councilwoman Hiller a little bit. She doesn't have to join in what I'm about to say. but and, and I don't mean this adversarially. And I've had this conversation with some of our counterparts at the county. But, you know, that asset's very important to the county. They put a lot of taxpayer money and their own money into that asset. We recognize that. We stepped up to help continue to make sure that that asset has value through this hotel. And so I do think, and uh, my, I guess my expectation is, is that they are ready to step up and help us with this process and make sure that we can all work together on that. And so that's the, 
that's what I throw over to the county at this point, both privately and publicly, and, and let them know we're, we're ready to talk and work it out. So let, let's start having those conversations. Okay, thank you. Well, do you have further questions? I want to make sure that everybody uh, has time to kind of take this all in. I th thank you, Rick, for your explanation. I think it's, for me, pretty obvious uh, which direction we'd like to go because you have met our expectations along with Braxton in listening to this governing body that we want to do everything we can to make this asset attractive to a, a uh, qualified owner operator and as soon as possible but make sure that we've you know, crossed all the t's and dotted our i's so that we just don't put ourselves back in the situation that we wanted to avoid in the first place uh, so I, I appreciate the expertise that you bring to this evaluation because for us this is a new venture and i think um, it still makes some of us a little uh, nervous mm -hmm. but, you, but we have to move forward and in my opinion, I would have to uh, agree with uh, Councilman Dover. I think that you've presented a good set of options. You've given us, I think, a, better, a good feel for what the condition of the asset is in and your willingness to continue to help find that owner-operator that can move us forward in maybe a shorter amount of time than it would take to start the RFP process. So I would support his suggestion. Councilwoman Hiller. Thank you. One more. Again, when we first got into this, there was discussion that a study had been done and there was a recommendation out of that study that a purchaser might be interested in building a second hotel on that overall Expo Center site to optimize the capacity to handle conventions, events, whatever that study said. Um, and so while we're talking about making sure we've got all the pieces in order, was that information shared with you, and should we then include w willingness to negotiate about the real estate for the site of a second um, hotel? W would that be significant to, to recruiting the right buyer? So a couple of a couple of points. The Gray study is the only study I'm aware of, and the Gray study most certainly didn't make a recommendation to build a second hotel. Um, I will also point out that the vast majority of the site is in the floodplain, and building a, okay. uh, building a second hotel in many, many places would not be possible because you could not get a no-rise certificate. Okay. There would only be a very, very small area where potentially a second hotel could be, that could be built. So I, I think that that's um, so much conjecture that I, I think that that would cloud, cloud the picture as opposed to just truly looking for someone to purchase this this hotel and again with the quantity of rooms that we have if large events that need 500 700 rooms the other hotels would be in town would be more than happy to help accommodate those those guests without having a second hotel on site thank you I just was trying to remember all the information that had been given to us earlier and make sure we were either working on it or setting it aside thank you okay. thank you I don't want to uh Move this. I want to move this along because we do have council meeting coming up here. And we do have one more agenda item. Okay, yes. And that's why I was going to ask uh, Brenda if you would read the next agenda item. Approval of a request for Hotel Topeka operational funding in the amount of $500,000 contingent upon governing body approval of the transfer of the funds to the Topeka Development Corporation. Okay. City Manager? Well, Mayor and Governing Body, you've heard the, um, <clears throat> you've heard the resolution. I would um, encourage you to approve that resolution. It is it is the next critical step in getting this hotel back to being functional and working to get it on the market and into a private developer's hands. Do we have a presentation now? Um, no, I, let me, if I could just take a minute and sure. basically walk through uh, the items in your agenda packet. Um, GF Hotels has provided us with a request for funding of operational funds to the tune of $227,000 to get us through January and February. Uh, we have provided you with information, including the um, where the money, the initial $500,000 has been spent. So $417,000 has been spent to date. Um, 
outlining what those, those amounts are. We have 82,000 left over. Um, during the council meeting, there will, we will be making a request that you take action on an item that was added to the agenda, and that would be to approve a tranche of, of additional $500,000 to allow for us to cover this operational funding request, as well as some capital requests that we know that are going to be coming in. Uh, most notably, we've had some items that failed on inspections that we have to get prepared. We had a fire sprinkler line that froze and burst during the cold weather, causing some flooding damage so that we have some other items so that we're not coming back to you on a weekly or monthly basis. We are going to ask for the $500,000 tranche, which is it's specifically intended to cover this 227 of operational funding plus some additional capital items that we are aware of that will be coming in. So with that, that I'll gladly stand for any questions, and I have Rochelle here as well um, to, to walk through and answer any questions that you have on the operational funding. And I will point out under the terms of the management agreement, we have to maintain a minimum operational funding of 150000 and as the owner, we are responsible for funding any shortfalls and this is a uh, pro projected shortfall based on, on revenue and expenses. Councilman Dober. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, City Manager, wh where do we stand in terms of reserves right now in the general fund? Just a rough idea of where we're at, percentage-wise. Michelle. Happy to take that one. I have the answer for you right here. Uh, I figured you did, yeah. <laughs> so we ended the 2022 fiscal year at about $27 million in the general fund. Um, we are still finalizing the 2023 results. We are missing the one last sales tax payment due to the lag with KDOR, um, but we are projecting additional revenue surplus for 2023. Um, I, it's going to be somewhere between 5 and $8 million. I would caveat that number with, we're still doing final projections and waiting on that last text or tax file to see how well Christmas went in our community, but we are projecting a revenue surplus. Thank you. Christmas was fantastic, I understand. Mm -hmm. um, so we would take the 500000 out of reserve. Is that essentially yes. it? Yes. Mm -hmm. Very good. Thank you, Mayor. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If I may, so your the policy that we have for reserves would not allow us to access um, general fund reserves for operational items. Um, we are putting a plan together based on Braxton's team and the position, uh, the condition assessment to address cap X items with the surplus, but operational would still need to come from the general fund per our policy. Councilman Duncan. Is that a policy or an ordinance by law that we have to follow? It is a resolution that this body has set that this body could change, but I believe Rochelle has uh, concerns uh, that she reminded me of when I said you can waive any rule. <laughs> yes. You, yes, of course, you could waive that resolution to do that items. It would carry some additional risks um, with financial analysis of using those reserves to fund operations. It could serve as a red flag to our investors, bond rating agencies, and other people who are invest in the city's assets. Can, just to clarify, there are sufficient 2024 operating funds to be able to fund this request without going into the 2023 reserves. Does that help? That's no, that's fine. I just okay. city manager. Okay. Anything motion. further? Okay, so approval. have a motion to approve by Councilman Dober. <laughs> I'll second it. <laughs> All right. Okay. Director Siller? Yes. Valdivia Acala? No. Ortiz? No. Banks? No. Kale? Yes. Miller? Right. Dobler? Yes. Duncan? Yes. Hofer? Yes. And Padilla? Yes. <clears throat> All right, we have six yes. The motion carries. We have Council uh, Directors Valdivia, Acala, Ortiz, and Banks voting no. Okay. Thank you. Uh, uh, Brenda, do we have any other business coming before this body? No, we do not. Okay. Is anyone signed up for public comment? No. Okay. 
Is there a need for an executive session? No. Okay. So, no further business to come before this body, the Topeka Development Corporation. I adjourn this meeting. Thank you.